possibly the most exciting video I have done or will ever do. I'm here with Lauren Burke and Hannah Chapman of Bonnets at Dawn fame. This is, uh, I think my favorite podcast is a literary podcast. Um, and it started out specifically focusing on the Brontes versus Jane Austen, um, but it has expanded to so much more. So uh, just a big thank you to Hannah and Lauren. Thank you for doing this today. And maybe you could talk about um, how you started the podcast and kind of what was the catalyst to make you incorporate uh, more authors to, you know, besides Jane Austen and the Bronte sisters, because they are fascinating already, but it seems like you've incorporated more people. Mm -hmm. Kate, I'm blushing. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for having us. We really appreciate it. Um, Hannah, I'll start and then you correct me because this is how this usually goes, right? <laughs> we'll just get it right the first time. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. <laughs> I'll give that was you really rude. Do you edit this? Is that getting cut or is that just... No, it's going. All of your rudeness is going right Dang. to YouTube. It'll be okay. authentic. Yes. Okay. Sorry, mom. If you want um, to so I think I give the short version in our book, but basically Hannah and I are best friends and we did really want to work on some sort of project together. And um, we just, we started this podcast, Austin versus Bronte, Bonnets at Dawn. And we thought we might do a book someday about Jane Austen. We weren't really sure how that looked, how that would look because there are so many books about Jane Austen. Mm. Um, but we thought we'd do the podcast and see sort of where it took us. And um, we did Austin versus Bronte for a while. And then Elizabeth Gaskell snuck in. And Gaskell is the one that changed the show. Gaskell's house in Manchester definitely played a big role in that, I think. I think that's the short version, right, Hannah? Yeah. Yeah. We were going to do like 12 episodes. We had them all planned out. They were going to be very like combative, just like our relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I'm team Austin and Lauren was like team Bronte and then I remember Lauren being like oh this lit home in Manchester is looking for volunteers so I've told them that you'll work in the tea room was basically yeah. <laughs> I said I'll do I your got. social media yeah. and Hannah will <laughs> mop your floors <laughs> which is I think I was a waitress at the time so I qualified was like, for that. I could, totally qualified. I just wanted like busman's holiday. I just wanted to go to Manchester, but without <laughs> doing the washing up. Um, so we went to Gaskell's house and learned so much about her. And we did a North and South watch along. Was that at the same time? I can never remember yeah, when we, we did, did the read along that. around there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I remember reading the book on the coach on the way mm -hmm. to oh. Gaskell's house. Oh my I, goodness. I'd seen North and South, but I hadn't read it before. And so just like all of the Bronte stuff we've ever done, I really went into everything with Gaskell without knowing anything. Yeah, Lauren, same. were you? Yeah. Yeah, like knew of her, but had never read anything um, until I started reading The Life of Charlotte Bronte for the show. Uh, and then um, Gaskell kind of kept popping up. She's another figure like um, like Harriet Beecher Stowe, like haunts the show because she's just is in the background of everything. And so, um, yeah, just Gaskell. Gaskell is the game changer. And then we were like, mm -hmm. okay, who else are we missing? There's probably mm -hmm. a ton of people because um, I think the only... The only women that I read in high school that were like on the curriculum, um, Maya Angelou and uh, Jane Austen for summer reading, I think. Mm -hmm. So I've missed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> there is, I mean, it's just vast, that, uh, but you have to dig, you know, more for women authors. Um, but it's amazing what you do find when you do dig. Mm -hmm. But it's just so exciting to me that you say Elizabeth Gaskell was the catalyst for that, because to me, she is kind of this happy medium in between the Brontes and Jane yeah. Austen. Um, yeah, definitely. She's definitely like, she's more emotionally, you, you're going to have more turmoil in her books than you would in Austen or, or maybe be more up close and personal when mm -hmm. characters are going through turmoil, definitely in North and South. Yeah. Um, but it's a little bit lighter than um, definitely Jane Eyre or Wuthering Heights. Mm -hmm. For sure. <laughs> yes. Um, so then who are some of the authors that you have found through the podcast that have just been really lovely, pleasant surprises? Oh God, so many. 
Mm. Where do we even start? Um, well, there's Sarah Piot. I'm just throwing out a name because I loved Sarah Piot and her poetry. And she was a poet from Kentucky that kind of lived on the Kentucky, Ohio border. And a lot of her poetry is, is quite confrontational about, it's about abolition and racism. And um, I'm totally going to get her birthday wrong. Let's say it's like 18... 40s. I'm probably wrong, but there is a Bonnet to Dawn episode about her and sort of about the really like fascinating uh, work that the OSU, the Ohio State University um, library and professors are doing to sort of uncover her work. So I really, I'm going to just go with Sarah Piat, but there's probably 20 other people that I'm forgetting about. And now I'm just thinking of someone, but Hannah, you go. <laughs> uh, I think my, the one that comes to mind most readily at the moment is Frances Harper just because um when you think about Austin like there's this little pub quiz question like where does the like what was the initial title of Pride and Prejudice it was First Impressions right Mm -hmm. where does the phrase Pride and Prejudice come from and it comes from Frances Burney and when we did Gaskell I had this huge rant about how North and South was just lifting so heavily from Pride and Prejudice (laughs) and like really dug into that and I'm really interested in like the I guess metaphorical baton that these authors are passing um and I was like it can't end with Gaskell like who's next on the list and then we read last year we read Contending Forces by Francis Harper and I remember I Pauline Hopkins oh, oh my god <laughs> I knew I was good. <laughs> um, but I thought for a minute you were going with because I can Francis we... Harper <laughs> rewind <laughs> yes you can <laughs> No, we don't need to. You know why? It's because it's the Francis Harper comic was getting shared all over social media this week. Uh, <laughs> from the and Francis Harper, um, uh, I think she was inspired by Sense and Sensibility for the two offers. Oh, yeah. It still works, what you're mm. saying. It still oh. works. Mm-hmm. But Pauline Hopkins. <laughs> Is that embarrassing? I don't need to be embarrassed. No. It's fine. No. I'm just like. Much information you're keeping track of in your head. Mm. don't try and gatekeep me YouTube (laughs) I'm embarrassing myself okay so Pauline Hopkins wrote Contending Forces and I messaged Lauren after reading it and being like I think this is the missing link I think this is the book that comes after North and South because it just there's so much about it that felt familiar and Pauline Hopkins does really interesting things which Jane Austen is also doing in Pride and Prejudice um where you're hiding like these radical or politically charged ideas in a romance uh, like just a, a romance mm-hmm. so people are like oh it's just a love story oh it's just this and there's really challenging ideas in there so I sent that message to Lauren and then looked at the book and the full title is contending forces and then what's the subtitle north and a tale of a tale of north and south yeah and I was like oh okay right that's where it's come <laughs> from I just wish yeah. I could remember the name so as clearly as I remember that <laughs> light, light bulb moment. Very cool. That's fine. <laughs> You're good. You're good. Drink some more wine. <laughs> there you go. Um, oh, I love your mugs. Very fun. Oh, that's a good one. Um, and yes, I will make sure to link the all of the, all of the things down below, social media and the uh, maybe I'll link a couple specific podcast episodes that we referenced. Oh, so awesome. We'll all cool. be in there. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. So now um, I don't want to choose annoying questions, but let's just say this week, uh, Hannah, what your favorite Austin is and Lauren, what your favorite Bronte is. And if you could give a nugget, like if they're still your favorite authors, maybe it's changed since you started the podcast, but why you love them so much and as of, as of this week, what your favorite work by them is. It does change, which is true. Um, I'm going to go with Agnes Gray. I love Anne Bronte. She's my girl. We did a great Agnes Gray read along. And I was quite nervous about it because it's a really short book. There's not, it's not super meaty. I mean, we've done North and South. We've done Wives and Daughters. Like those are like big books. And um, I was like, oh gosh, are we, how, how much material are we going to get out of Agnes? Mm. And so much, 
like the episode that we did with Amber sort of about Victorian governesses and just, you know, the politics of women working in the Victorian era was fascinating. And um, yeah, and I think it's just, it's overlooked. And guys, you can read it in a weekend. It's so good. So Agnes Gray. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I do think it's really, um, it's very easy on the brain, but Mm -hmm. I don't have less of an emotional impact when I'm reading it. Yeah, I, I really like Agnes Gray. And Conte is my favorite Bronte, but I still I'm still team Austin. And it's still I think it's always <laughs> persuasion. I don't see that getting knocked off my top spot for Austin at all. Um we've been doing like a deep dive on Pride and Prejudice recently mm-hmm. uh for a side project. And man, Mr. Collins is interesting, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> He's so interesting. I think that's why Austin is just number one right because you can have all of these thoughts and you can read it once or a million times and then really think about like what a character is saying in the letter like in a letter what does that mean what conversation haven't we seen on the page that's taken place to prompt that and what does that mean about the story and how does it reflect on Austin's life there's just so many layers so Mm -hmm. I don't think I'll ever get tired of uh, analyzing <laughs> yeah no there are um just so many turns of phrase that I'll be like oh never noticed that before mm-hmm. um one thing that I think is fun when you're watching the 90 which I know you guys maybe you prefer the 2005 Pride and Prejudice but if you watch the, uh, <laughs> what do you <think> that? <laughs> I don't know why I'm offended Matthew McFadden because Matthew yeah. McFadden is like talking he's about hot we do yeah. love yeah. Really hot. he's That's a beautiful true. man I actually but I had Colin Firth on my school planner Oh, I had oh, a photo okay. of him taped on there. <laughs> it was that was niche in year twelve. That no one had that. That was weird. You were that woman. Mm, yeah. Still is. So, so I guess you like that one too. Yeah. I personally, the last time I watched it, I had fun just watching Mr. Hurst throughout it because yeah, yeah, <laughs> he's drinking or asleep or eating, and then even in one instance when the rest of the Bennett women come. To visit when Jane and Lizzie are staying at um where is it Netherfield is that the name of it yeah okay um and he like slyly like slips out of the room he, he's like <laughs> waiting by the door and they get greeted and then he just like slips out the door mm. so I enjoyed Mr. Hurst last time I love that, that sounds like me that sounds like the real life me <laughs> in the background eating drinking sleeping I love like every reaction he has to Elizabeth Bennett because I feel like Caroline and Mrs. Hurst are like, hmm. And then like Mr. Bingley's trying to be nice. Mr. Darcy's doing his aloof thing. And Mr. Hurst is just like, what are you talking about? (laughs) He always just really reacts. He's never met. Like he's the person that just really shows how unusual she is within their society because he just, uh, he's so rude that he just allows himself to like show it. (laughs) That is interesting to think about how you get to see kind of Liz, more of Lizzie's character from his mm. very transparent reactions to her, calling her singular for not liking playing yeah. cards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, um, have you heard of Mary Stewart? Because I in your mm. episode that you talked about Anne Radcliffe some, mm-hmm. which I think it was early in season four, which season four was epic. It was like four seasons in in one season. Um, it was. <laughs> Editing it felt epic as well. Oh, I can I can only imagine. Um, but Anne Radcliffe, this you know gothic notion of uh, people being in a foreign country and out of their familiar um, environment. And that's very much Mary Stewart. So she is also famous. She had uh, an Arthur series, like Arthurian legend series. Mm. But she also had a series of books like Nine Coaches Waiting, Madam Will You Talk. She wrote, I think it was the 30s through the 60s. It was a long time, Mm. 1930s through 1960s. Um, And it's just women traveling alone. And all of a sudden there are shady people around them. (laughs) Yes, they're shady people. And here's this hot guy and like, is he good or is he bad? And you just mm. have to decide. Is that kissing? Oh, uh-huh. uh, there is kissing. Yeah. I'm in, let's when go. You're in. Traveling <laughs> yeah. and kissing, mm. we're in. Yes. I, someone told me about Mary Stewart mm-hmm. 
she's on. So I have like these lists of women authors because this happens to us like wherever we go, obviously someone will, we went to like a literary homes conference and we had a couple of people come up to us and they were just like, have you covered this person and this person and this person? And I'm just like, I'm just making a list. I'm making a list. <laughs> will you come on and talk about them? Because <laughs> you sound like you're an expert. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure the list is ever growing. Um, okay. And then another author, two, two other, like, mm-hmm. just put it, putting a bug in your ear. Um, Mary Elizabeth Braddon. I just noticed actually yes. on the Facebook page, someone had brought her up and she's fascinating mm-hmm. to me because you just hear about Lady Audley's secret. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually one of my favorite series, the Betsy Tacey series, uh, one of the girls gets in trouble because her father finds out that she has Lady Audley secret and he tosses it into the stove and he's like that's such a we great don't side. read books like this we have Shakespeare and Dickens and <laughs> what I love is like his Dickens plots are just as pulpy um mm-hmm. but it's maybe I don't know people think of it as being fancier or I don't know more cerebral yeah, um, he's a man. He's a yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah pretty much pretty much I feel um, like people bring up Lady Audley secret every week mm-hmm. every week Amber is desperate to do it, actually, to come on the show and do it. So I definitely think um, we're talking about doing Scandal and Gossip as a mini series, And um, so there are some things in the works for that. And that sounds pretty good. I love that so much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yes. And also, Hannah, how you were saying how Jane Austen has these, if you just look at it at a glance, it seems kind of simple. But then once you peel back the layers, mm-hmm. and I, I think the same is true for Mary Elizabeth Braddon. And I've read um, Lady Audley's Secret and then The Doctor's Wife. And The Doctor's Wife is particularly fun because there is a character who is a sensation novelist in it. Oh, cool. And so it's kind of poking fun at itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Aurora Floyd. So yeah, she's... Oh, yeah. She's, yeah. Um, I, sensation novels, we are all about them. She's a little bit later than who we've usually mm. covered. I feel like we're moving in time <laughs> slightly. Um, and then the last one was, I know George Eliot is very, um, mm. well, she's very long. She's very long winded, but I did read in January her novella, Janet's Repentance. Mm. And I feel like Bonnet's listeners could really enjoy it because it is basically Cranford meets the tenant of Wildfell Hall. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Like yeah. Jane. I've heard of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I would put that on the list for Elliot. Elliot's always hard because we mm-hmm. want to do more Elliot, but, but everyone wants to read Middlemarch. <laughs> everyone wants to read Middlemarch. And so we had like a casual read along of Middlemarch um, because the read alongs for us take so much time. Oh, so much work for you. Yeah. So we're like, middle March is going to be hard, but let's try a casual read along, see how people respond. And I think like everyone fell off like Mm. at that half point. So we will definitely try something that's a little bit more manageable with George Eliot. I just lent my copy of middle March to a friend and gave it, I gave it to her and I was like, take this book because it's about a young woman who puts too much faith in a disappointing man that just gave it to her and like sent her off from the doorway. Like <laughs> that was the closest we could get to her hangout in COVID times, me giving her this massive depressing book and being like, learn from, <laughs> learn from George Eliot, child. Yeah. You're not getting that one back for a while. That's not coming back, is it? Mm-hmm. Oh, I know. Years, years. <laughs> um, so season four was just, gargantuan um so season five is in the works it Mm -hmm. is I was just taping an interview I'm in the in the studio the studio right now um so yeah we are coming back with a blue castle read-along um by Ellen Montgomery and um spoiler alert we love this book (laughs) I was going to ask and I was hoping you would because it does start out it, it starts out a little slow and just agonizing mm-hmm. for the situation that you see. Also, how are you guys? How have you heard her name is said? Because there's much debate between Valency and Valancy. Valency. But so, I did it by audiobook, so okay. I'm biased. Ah. Yeah. Um, so the first interview is with Dr. Kate Scarth from the LM Montgomery Institute. Mm-hmm. And I asked her that. I said, Valency? Valancy? Because my Chicago accent wants to say Valancy. <laughs> <laughs> And she was like, you can say Valancy. I 
think it's Valency. <laughs> and she laid some pretty good evidence for why she thinks that, so. Okay, this is good to know because yeah. the only reason I thought maybe not Valency was I was like, isn't that a scientific term? But I think but it's just a homonym. A what? What what's it a term for? What is it? Is it something? I don't even gross? know. See, I I should have asked. <laughs> my husband's a chemist. I should have like checked with him before. Yeah, like some I can't kind even of rash. What it is. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yes, I'm very excited that you are both liking the Blue Castle because I think it's just glorious. Yeah, I our listeners are loving it too. Like the read along is going really well. People have got. As per usual, um, our listeners are crazy smart and wonderful mm. and great with analysis. So there are already like too many comments to get into the episodes. I'm like, oh, okay, great. There's already 200 amazing comments here that I probably cannot fit in. <laughs> Could we talk about some of the literary tourism that you have been able to do, which I'm sure mm. 2020 made it hard because that was really not a thing that was happening. Um, but yeah, maybe something you didn't anticipate doing as much as you did with the podcast, but it's been really cool to to follow. Do you want to kick it off, Hannah? I, yeah, tourism? I I did some lit tourism last year. I snuck I some in like the last week of March before you UK lockdown. There you <laughs> go. Yeah, I went down to uh, Chawton House Library in Alton, which is where Jane Austen lived for some time. And uh, they had a, an exhibition called Man Up, which was all about women in history stepping into like men's roles. And it had things, uh, it had stuff about like George Sand in there. It had stuff about George Eliot and the Brontes and pirates and actresses and air balloonists. And it was really, it was really fascinating. Um, we've been to Chawton House twice for the show yeah. now. So that was really fun to go back. I think there's an episode where we're arguing over whether or not it's like impressive. Because <laughs> I think the first time we went to the library, you're like, this is a decent house. I don't know if it's, it's a great Austin, house. Austin calls it the great house. And I was like, we've, we have been to bigger houses, right? Austin, we have been to I'm sure houses. has been to bigger houses. <laughs> anyway. But it's a lovely house. But it's a, a lovely, lovely house. library. I don't know why I always tell that story because it makes <laughs> it sound like I don't like it. And I love it. It's one of my favorite places um yeah I, well, I think it, I, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if you thought it wasn't the most like amazing thing because wasn't it basically like an extra cottage that her brother had <laughs> no or, or her house no. oh her house is the, the cottage oh. and then just down the road is Chotten house which is her brother's house okay see I, yeah. think I didn't realize that I think yeah I was, yeah okay you can visit them both in like one day it's a great uh, actually day trip great. to hit both of them up Okay. Lauren, I'm so glad you worked that out because I was like, that's not a cottage. <laughs> <laughs> totally like, yeah. No, Jane Austen lived on a, in a cottage, which is like around the corner. And I that see. was just, that was a spare. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But it is, I guess it was a great, Chawton House was a great house. Chawton House is bigger than the cottage. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Very yeah. <laughs> they're both great. <laughs> they both sound great. From like a visiting standpoint, they're both great. And you should oh, go yes. to both yeah. of them. That's so cool. And then uh Lauren, what what would you say the house that you were just like very taken with? Ooh, that's that's a hard one. I will say, so the last bit of literary tourism that I did was was that December 2019? The last time we saw each other, November, December, around mm. then. Yeah. Um it's very weird that Hannah and I have not been in the same place for this long, actually. Um, but we went to the Lake District and oh. I love the Lake District. Like I really fell in love with it. And people were saying, you're going to fall in love with it. You're going to fall in love with Dorothy Wordsworth. And I was like, okay, all right. And then they were right. So <laughs> like a challenge. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> Come out with I, Dorothy. yeah, I'm like, okay, maybe. And then they were right. So um, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, we stayed in John Ruskin's how like coach house, I guess. Wow, just some house that he, he it was just he just house built it. he like built it. Yeah, on yeah. his like estate. So Hannah was like, "Yeah, this house is like really affordable. Let's rent it out and stay there." And it was John Ruskin's, and it had this great Victorian bathtub, which I'll have to find the picture of, which that didn't work, cool. right? <laughs> yeah. Which 
I mean, I wonder how many different famous Victorian figures possibly set foot in that house as well. Totally. It was loads, wasn't it? Loads. Yeah. yeah. And it has beautiful views of like the lake and the mountains and it just was mm. gorgeous. So uh, staying in the house was great. And we had um, Sally from Gaskell's house stay with us and we were like cooking dinner and lighting fires. And, and my mom. And your mom came down. <laughs> oh, it was lovely really sweet. <laughs> she lives in the Lake District. So she came. And, um, you know, then we visited Dove Cottage, which is not a great house. It is, it is very much a cottage. Um, but the Wordsworth Trust, or now the Grasmere, Wordsworth Grasmere, mm. Mere, can't talk. Wordsworth Grasmere, as they are called now, um, have several like little buildings on site, um, which Very are really cool. cool. So it's a great site, highly recommend it. Great walking, great yes. reading, all of it. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so kind of the catalyst for me asking you ladies to do this interview is that you 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 have a baby. You have a, a book baby. Do you, do you why do you? she wrote and you got it. I got it. Oh, are you gonna hold that? It is. <laughs> there it is. In all it its is. glory. Oh uh, I think that was Jane Austen. We had like a meet <laughs> yesterday because it hasn't arrived in the UK for me yet. So Lauren phoned me and we did like a video call to check for mistakes. <laughs> don't worry there's none it's perfect it's, it's perfect, perfect. Mm. Um, so unbeknownst to lauren and hannah i had actually pre-ordered a copy so there is going to be a giveaway because then i was offered Ooh. a review copy so well I'll, I'll i'll just take a little leaf out of the bonnets at dawn book and you can comment below with your favorite breakfast food and Perfect. I'll draw Perfect. randomly out of a hat and um, someone will receive this book. It is coming out, is it April 25th? April 20th. Just kidding, April 20th. Yeah, um, all good. Yeah. But you can get it on the 25th, so that's cool too. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, this is very exciting. And you wanna kind of give some of the details about this book and, and yeah. how you put it together. Hannah, you're so good at summarizing the book because here's the deal with the book is that it has lots of parts like there's essays there's comics um there's a, like there's a there's this big format for it and every time I do it I'm just like ah oh, there's this and there's this and there's this and people are like whoa Lauren this sounds like the Helena Bonham Carter of books like that's too many things <laughs> and a Tory um <laughs> oh I didn't know that <laughs> you just <laughs> sorry yeah. so why she wrote has uh, 18 authors in it and what the book gave us the opportunity to do that the podcast doesn't give us the opportunity is because you could never talk about 18 authors in one episode that's too many things it's too many ideas it's too many comparisons and links and so why she wrote is really Lauren and my opportunity to look at a really wide range of authors from mostly from North America and Europe but from all different walks of life and backgrounds and, and different countries and talk about the kind of linking threads that kind of connect their lives, their attitudes to work, what they were writing about, and then really explore that through essays. And then because it's a book, uh, we were able to add some visual media to it. So through comics and illustrations, we have illustrated fun facts, we have um, selected reading lists. So we have to say they're selected because on some of our authors who wrote 45 books, they didn't include all of the books. And on other authors, they wrote one book. So the, the, re the reading lists are like a bit, they're all over the place. But it was a really fun opportunity to group these women into like these different sections. And so you've got a chapter on the Gothic, you've got a chapter on how profitable they were and what they had to do to stay profitable and to protect that on writing through hardship, on activism, on identity, on uh, writing when you have a secret, like all sorts of ideas. It's good. <laughs> You're getting choked up. I, I like stopped breathing when I was saying that. <laughs> I think too, like, um, there's a lot of books out there that are sort of these group biographies that are sort of 
you know, maybe like a bio and then a portrait. And uh, that kind of like takes you on a tour of like women's writing. I will say um, we kind of steered in a slightly different direction because we weren't going for something that was like comprehensive because there are so many authors that we want to continue doing, right? But um, we did almost approach it. I think in an early idea was like a six degrees of Jane Austen. And so you really do see like the links between these authors, people that are responding to each other, they're reading each other's work. George Eliot, famous for that. So a lot of, a lot of quotes from George Eliot in here about what she yeah, thinks of other people. Salty. I, I love <laughs> salty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she is. I like it. Uh, so yeah, so we've got a lot of that in there. I like to see how people are connected and who's reading who and, you know, who's meeting who, like I'm into that too. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's just really special to see kind of the experience of womanhood throughout history through the lens of their writing mm -hmm. um, and just really inspirational. I personally um, kind of look for the any elements of chronic illness that is represented because I have a chronic illness. And so particularly Louisa May Alcott and Elizabeth Gaskell, um, I just, I read both of their biographies and was like, I'm just going to keep reading them because this is just, um, they're warriors, you know, to, yeah. to push through and to have these lasting works that people are still reading today. So I can't wait to find out about new to me authors through this book. Um, people that, uh, you know, you aren't just going to see displayed at the bookshop uh, there for you. People that are kind of under the radar. It will be very cool. And what's really cool about it as well, I think we should say, is that um, all of the illustrations were done by Kaylee Bales, who's a fantastic illustrator. And so there are like almost 180 pages of comics in there, mm -hmm. as well as portraits of all of the authors and all of the, the spot illustrations and stuff. And so a lot of work went into bringing them to life. And Kaylee did a lot of research into how they looked. And I think this is my favorite character in it is Beatrix Potter's dad. Because <laughs> I remember Kaylee sending me the sketches for him and I was like, excellent, excellent. <laughs> and I just think about him all the time now. And Beatrix Potter didn't like her dad that much, spoiler. <laughs> so to just think, for me to think about him, I probably think about him more than Beatrix Potter did. That's amazing. Probably. That kind of jogs my memory. Have you guys seen floating around? Um, and maybe I even saw on the bonnet such on Facebook, the picture mm -hmm. of William Gaskell with little Beatrix Potter. Mm, yes. Which is very sweet Absolutely. and just not a combination I would have thought have I, I would have thought of meeting one another. Elizabeth Gaskell or the Gaskells sort of just they knew everybody. They really <laughs> did. I think I did like an Anne Radcliffe to Elizabeth Gaskell tree once. Really? It's in there. Yeah, I mean it's not it's it's not strong, but I love sort of you know doing a six degrees of and it's there it's there <laughs> oh, you could do you could do a six degrees of kevin bacon of the gas schools you could make yeah that you work, could right like yeah, eventually. absolutely <laughs> she knew um she, elizabeth gaskell knew florence nightingale right mm -hmm. and harriet beecher stowe of course yes yes harriet mm. beecher stowe that i still i'm nervous about reading her i haven't well i will say in the works we don't have a time specifically for this but what we would like to do because Harriet Beecher Stowe haunts the show she <laughs> knew everybody <laughs> she was in everyone's business she's in every biography that we she's like in every research. yeah and we have sort of been avoiding her um although we did an episode about her and Lord Byron which was pretty fantastic she was in Lord Byron's business as well so there you go but um we are going to talk about Harriet Jacobs who wrote Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl and um, Harriet Beecher Stowe. They had some interactions, <laughs> we'll say. Uh -huh. And um, I would love to do a back-to-back -back reading of Uncle Tom and Incidents so we could really also talk a little bit about own voices and that sort of thing. Yes, yes. And I really, I have appreciated um, how you've brought own voices th um, through the lens of, 19th century literature, 18th, 20th, all of it. Um, because I, I, I had this interaction with someone that I met one time. Um, it was at church. She was new. I, you know, never met her before. And 
she's an engineer. And I always, I always struggle like making conversation with women that are engineers, like our brains just work very differently. And so I thought, why don't I tell her about my 19th century book club that I, that I run, which is at a Victorian mansion in Philadelphia. So it's very fun. Amazing. I, Can we it, come? <laughs> Listen, you would be there right now. With, yeah, not now, but it would be very exciting. Um, so yes, it's the Ebenezer Maxwell mansion. And so I said, oh my gosh, oh. is it a great house? Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> On a scale of like one to great. Is it, you like, want it, you want it to be, Hannah only goes if it's great. I, I mean, think it's, it's, great. Great. it's a, a million. <laughs> There, there's, there's, uh, I mean, it's, you, you can get lost for days. No, it's, it's, a, it's very cool though, because it is, it's like, I felt like I was stepping onto a movie set. I had never mm, been into yeah. a home. Um, but so I said, oh, I will just, you know, bring up my book club. And I said, oh, I, I run a Victorian book club. And she said, wow, this is the most white church I've been to. And oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, there's so many things about that statement. I was just kind of like, okay, nice to meet you. And then I just walked right. away. But th there's like so many elements about that statement that are mm -hmm. troublesome to me. Um, so then you're saying that it's only for white people and right, right. just a lot wrong right. with it. So I, I remembered uh, first being really struck by you talking about what a fascinating character Heathcliff is mm -hmm. um, for that aspect, because he is kind of ambiguous with his, his background. Yeah, definitely. And I'm a very light skinned black woman. And um, Wuthering Heights was one of the first books, you know, that I read. Uh, first classics. <laughs> Let me start over. Wuthering Heights was one of the first classics that I read. And I actually think I did read that one in school or maybe just like a bit of it in school. You just like pretended to read it. I think school. I probably <laughs> just pretended to read it the way I pretended to read Middle March for you. Um, yeah. But... <laughs> Um, yeah, there, there is, you know, we've talked a little bit about it on the show and hopefully we're going to talk a little bit more with some Bronte scholars coming up soon about some of the evidence, uh, that, you know, Heathcliff was possibly mixed race and sort of, you know, maybe some other books that Emily is referencing, um, and oh. characters that she's referencing from that time. Um, it wouldn't be uncommon is the thing. It's not, it's not uncommon. Um, we've also obviously talked about the woman of color, which is a little bit earlier. It's a Regency, a Regency Georgian era novel um, about a mixed race character, um, an heiress from Jamaica coming over to England to get married. So uh, yeah, we definitely, we are always on the lookout for those representations in literature, not only because they're, you know, important to me, but our audience also craves them as well. So I don't, I don't think it's like a miss. I don't, I don't think your friend from church is like, no, what are our friends? because, <laughs> but I mean, I think the, the thing I'm trying to say is like classics are perceived as like very white culture mm -hmm. and they are gate kept as such. And they are, you know, I think we need to think about like the communities and the societies and the clubs and stuff that surround the classics and the books mm -hmm. that we promote and the authors that we promote and um how we talk about it with other people and just because you know when we did our Mansfield Park read along someone might read Jane Austen and not think that she's writing an abolitionist text mm. and if you don't think that then the least you can do is just be like respectful of people as they discuss all of the imagery and the direct references that she's making to slavery right and yeah. I think that something that happens within the classics is that people are like they'll see diversity as like an attack on their interest and so basically my point is like there is a lot of work to do to stop to challenge people's idea that that's the case mm -hmm. if you're not interested in it it would be very easy to just take it on face value and say like this community looks white centric and white oriented because for a long time the conversation has been so yeah yeah I don't yeah yeah I will I say like that's too. valid. It, it didn't come out of nowhere that she said that. Mm -hmm. And I will say too, like one thing that we are trying to work on now um, and we're working on various projects, not sure how it's going to take shape, but like Hannah and I are really interested in making 
those texts by women of color more accessible? Because that's the thing that we run into when we are researching for the podcast and we want to do a group reading and we want everyone to talk about Sarah E. Farrow, mm-hmm. you know, who's an African-American um, Victorian novelist, Victorian era um, from Chicago. So we want everyone to see that, but then it's like, okay, now we have to find where this book is archived and accessible for people to read it because they can't get you know, a paper back of that or a hard back of that book. So, and the the cost of the paperbacks and hardbacks can be like super prohibitive. Like, oh. you can, not everyone can afford to spend like twenty five pounds on a like on a book. Like that is a luxury. Yeah. Um. And so the the problem that you run into with some of these authors is that they will be available on Amazon, or you know, that will be the only place you can get it, and it will be forty pounds for a new edition, and it will you know, because it's from a tiny press and the the press is doing an amazing job by keeping it in print, but it's only really scholars and academics who are going to access that, right? That's not like, these books need to be on like the buy two, get one free table in your local bookshop Mm -hmm. for them to just be read widely. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, you know, in 10 years, is there going to be like a Bonnets at Dawn publishing company? (laughs) That would be like our dream, honestly. We would (laughs) love to have like a Persephone style bookshop. That would be amazing. Because we could just have like desks on either side and shout at each other. (laughs) Like all day. (laughs) Well, I feel like it's not an unachievable thing. Like starting a Kickstarter Kickstarter campaign Mm -hmm. for the first couple you picked. That would be very exciting. And I do think there are people in the book community who are looking for that and are interested um, Mm. in that. Fingers crossed. I mean, I was actually just saying this this morning, someone we've been looking, I've been looking at to bring onto the show, just doing sort of the preliminary research is Ann Spencer. And it was like the same thing where I'm like, I'm finding bits and bobs and anthologies on Project Gutenberg, but this biography of Ann Spencer is $478. (laughs) So stuff like that. Yeah. We would, if you guys are interested, please like hit us up, let us know. We would, we'll look into it. Yeah. Just keep networking. You'll, it will find, it will find a way. Um, In the meantime, if you're looking for a really good affordable publisher, we always recommend Broadview Press, Broadview Mm. because they publish all sorts of books, all sorts of, um, all sorts of authors with really, really interesting introductions. So I've bought like a few books that I already have just because I know that the introduction in it is gonna be so good. And so, yeah, and they're affordable, like they're great. We've got a growing collection each. So yes, definitely check them out if you're looking for like just more diverse voices. Mm -hmm. That is cool. I will try to, um, I will will make sure to link them down below. So um, not diverse, but interesting is the fact that William Makepeace Thackeray's daughter was a best-selling Victorian author. Mm -hmm. Um, And I found out about her through her fairy tale collection, but she had a lot of best-selling novels in the day. And even on Project Gutenberg, there are like none of them. Oh, perfect. Oh Mm -hmm. God. Okay. I know. know. Like surely it's going to be good. No, it's not. Yeah. No. No. I always think of like Project Gutenberg's The Saving Grace and then you can't find something on there. Yeah. Project Gutenberg, I got me again. The same thing with Monica Dickens. Oh, so yeah. Persephone has, what is it? Mariana, right? Yeah. Mariana, great book. how British people would say it. Great yeah. book. But yeah, I, w- I wish more, more was out there from her. It'd be great. It'd be great yeah. for us. <laughs> yes, it would. Um, so a random note, but Hannah, I don't oh, no. know. No, no, no. This is so <laughs> eternally grateful uh I would not have found out about Kate Bush's Wuthering Heights were it not for you I I know it had not ever I had never come across it and now my husband and I are obsessed and one of the read-alongs that I'm the host of Victober which is during the month of October and we read Victorian literature it's like you know Christmas carols for December Mm. this is like the song I play and yeah (laughs) that's great (laughs) I love if that. If I never have to listen to someone sing that song at karaoke again, it would be too I, soon. Like that's how. Like, can't believe people sing that at karaoke. I think that's oh. that is not the right karaoke pick. I feel like <laughs> only Many Kate Bush could do that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Leave that for Kate. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so then I don't think I did ask specifically if you had authors, maybe do you have, um, if you could think of a top priority author that you would really like the podcast to do. Oh, there's I know you so said many. you have a whole list. Mm -hmm. At the moment, someone I'm really, uh, really interested in is Olive Schreiner. She was a South African author and Ooh. my mum's family is South African. And she, I think her book Dreams was, um, I've just been sent it by Broadview Press. Thank you. Um, and so I saw that and then I went on like a books and just got like this really old, beautiful edition and was telling Lauren that she does this really, I, I can understand why she's maybe fallen out of favor. Uh, as Dreams especially, it's very allegorical. So her parents were missionaries and you can really feel like that religious upbringing in her work and the symbolism is like mm, yeah. yeah definitely um but she's she's looking at really interesting concepts about like womanhood and she's so feminist and looking uh she's written an essay on gender that I really want to read now South Africa uh I'm like flirting with Olive Schreiner a bit because I want to know more about her politics before I'm like let's talk about Olive Schreiner on the show but that's something that you have to do with with all of the authors and we've we've been burnt before where you know you'll really relate to a piece or love a piece and then you find out that these are people who published or said things that we don't agree with today or the, and that people didn't agree with at the time and so it can be hard when you kind of put someone like just in that one piece of work do you mm -hmm. say that Lauren like when yeah. we read the yellow wallpaper yeah. we love the yellow wallpaper we maybe don't love Charlotte Perkins Gilman so yeah the but, eugenic yeah. stuff is is hard <laughs> yeah yeah it's just, yeah. just a little hard to swallow hard. <laughs> <laughs> that's just it's um just really it's so it's so startling but I guess it was in vogue for a fair number of people at the time that's like um there is some like right before World War II, you're going to read some things and be like, whoa, there were yeah. Nazi sympathizers um, and yeah. the people that wrote about it. And it was like the done thing. Mm -hmm. um, and and it happens. I mean, obviously, everyone that we've covered on the show, um, you know, there there's problematic things right in their past, like mm -hmm. Charlotte Bronte, like all, all of our gals have some some issues that we don't you know, we don't see eye to eye on. But um, for us, I, we're just, we're fine to just talk about it on the show and confront it. Like, mm -hmm. that's cool. I think it's mostly us just like sort of having a broad view of like what to expect, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And also make sure we're giving maybe the right analysis, uh, analysis on a piece of literature too. Because we're like, oh, we view it through this lens, but maybe they were writing it actually from this lens. So. And yeah. something Lauren said to me once about Charlotte Perkins Gilman is that um, we hold women writers to a much higher standard. So it would be so it's so much easier to say of Charlotte Perkins Gilman like we mustn't talk about that piece of work that she did because of this thing that she said which should be criticized and she should be held accountable for but we we really don't do that to male authors to the same extent like there were there were so many guys who were just lauded as like the kings of the classics who were doing all kinds of bad stuff mm -hmm. and it's brushed under the carpet all I mean, we stayed in Ruskin's house. We won't go into the problems we have yeah. with Ruskin. So there were some things, there were some issues there oh. that we learned at Ruskin's house. I believe yeah. we were like, oh dear. <laughs> Thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's like, um, I really, there are some of Dickens' books that I love. Like I love David Copperfield. Um, I love Dombey and Son. But what I can't do is the whole, um, so think about him writing A Christmas Carol. Mr. Dickens and his Carol. Is that what it's called? Or the man who invented Christmas? Yes. Yeah. I'm like, I can't, you like abandoned your wife and yeah. made it that she wasn't allowed to see her children at all. Like, I, I don't want to know about you. Like I, I will yeah. read your fiction, mm. um, but I don't want to spend time with Charles Dickens. <laughs> the first time I went to Charles Dickens house in London, it was really funny because I had like a really salty tour guide. <laughs> and they like clearly were just done for the day and I was like come on just give me give me a tour and he was like fine but he was like so over it and um he just like trashed Dickens the entire time he probably doesn't work there anymore <laughs> if anyone's wondering but um yeah 
he was hilarious and he was like oh yeah you know dickens problematic this issue this issue this issue and i was like whoa so i really road trip goes i'm from portsmouth and that's where charles dickens is from Mm. everyone and you can go to his birthplace and i used to go to charles dickens birthplace all the time Mm -hmm. as a child because my dad thought that was a wild afternoon out and it wasn't (laughs) what was wild was like leaning over the the barriers to set the alarm off because then you just hear the attendants go boom 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 up the stairs and say don't touch anything you're rude (laughs) um so that was good we never touched anything obviously but I've got a lovely Charles Dickin top hat if anyone's interested (laughs) I mean please do it for uh, the gram do it for the gram I really Mm -hmm. I really want to take Lauren there because there's the cutest little Airbnb next door yeah and then we can just go spend a day there we can go to the historic shipyard I mean, I'm ready. 2022. Fanny Price, she went to Portsmouth. That's true. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 2022 is going to be our our year of like literary tourism. So yes, we'll do it. (laughs) Perfect. So you did reference earlier, you did a North and South watch along and you've done a couple watch alongs. And the one that I think was the most amusing for me, because it is such a train wreck, was your Not My Pride and Prejudice episode on the Mormon pride and prejudice it's it's like it's so bad but I just I I have a confession like I think I've watched it around 10 times like over the years (laughs) so as Hannah mentioned we're actually writing a chapter in this Austin book Mm -hmm. and it's on pride and prejudice and Mr. Collins and uh I had to revisit that one so I have seen that actually 10 times in the last week you're joking Uh -uh. (laughs) how are you doing I'm I'm okay. I'm actually coming around to it. I think it's gonna movie, convert. <laughs> it might be holding me hostage. Um, but I I I'm finding things that I really appreciate. That Mr. Collins it. is great. That Mr. Collins, yeah. everyone else is not great. But yeah. that Mr. Collins is 10 out of 10. I think it's a great yeah. translation of Mr. Collins, which you'll yeah. find in our chapter. Because <laughs> isn't he supposed to be like big and tall? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So that's and 25. Cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 25. Yes. Um, and I had a group of friends recently, we watched it together on Instagram. And one of my friends at the end of the watch, just sent a picture of her laying on a couch with a giant pillow over her head. And she's like, I'm dead. I'm just dead. <laughs> and was it the Vincent, fondue scene that did it? Because that's the, <laughs> the fondue scene might have done is it. canon. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. It absolutely is. Yeah. She said the part that troubled her the most was that she wasn't expecting to find the Darcy compelling at all. And she's like, I was really struggling by the end. I was kind of rooting for him in a weird way. <laughs> I, my favorite thing about that, well, my favorite thing about it is Mr. Collins. My second favorite thing is the Austin quotes that they used to oh, break. Oh, yeah. Up. Yeah. I, oh, my God. You kind of love it. Weeks later, Jane Austen. Like, oh. <laughs> Her famous line. In case you were missing Jane Austen, here you go. (laughs) Just to make, you know, convince you this is in fact an Austen adaptation. Mm -hmm. Um, Gonna use that for something. (laughs) Now there is an Easter egg version that includes even more like Mormon (gasps) details in it. Do you have the DVD? I do not. I've just been watching it online, but now someone please send me this dvd if the if the writer director is out there i will happily have you on the show as well by the way that would be amazing to hear the like up to how these decisions were made for this mm-hmm. film what is like a mormon easter egg like whoa i think <laughs> oh okay like mormon history so like the great trap yeah. how mm. mary says you know my great aunt chestina had to spend a night in a real buffalo that's part of the Mormon trek. So like, oh. things like that. Thank yeah. you for explaining that because Thank I was you. confused by that <laughs> quote. And I have been for the past week, very confused by it. And it has nothing to do with what I'm writing, but. We had a comment in the it. Facebook group when that episode aired and someone said in that, they said, I'm a Mormon and these jokes do track. That's yeah, that's true. That is and true. they were just like, you don't get it because you're not a Mormon. And I was like, that is, Mm. you're correct. Yeah. I didn't realize. Because if you don't get the references, you're just going to be like, why is her aunt in a buffalo? Yeah, it's bizarre. But it's interesting, bizarre. It's an American thing. (laughs) (laughs) 
that's what all Americans do. Yeah. It's interesting though, actually. And now we have a little bit of a better understanding. We're like, oh, okay. Okay. Yes. We didn't get it the first time, guys. Sorry. If you go back and listen to that episode. I'm sure through Google, you could just Google like Mormon symbolism in 2003, Pride and Prejudice. Maybe something would pop up. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I need like a Medium article on it. Yeah. It's probably like a live journal out there somewhere. Yeah, that's (laughs) archived. That is funny, Hannah. I didn't think of how some of the things being like, is that just American? Yeah, I just, some of those jokes just. (laughs) Well, I loved, I learned that um, when the Crystal Palace was constructed and, Mm -hmm. you know, countries from all over the world put exhibits in, the Americans, of course, they stuffed a bald eagle. And that was like, that's cool. (laughs) That Americans brought a taxidermy bald eagle. British people definitely love taxidermy as well. That's very yeah. true. Is that is that That's your preferred true. gift maybe for my your... preferred gift yeah. when receiving guests from overseas would be some kind of a rare creature. Okay. Um well stuff. I will keep yeah. that in mind. Yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna come out with something really creative. I don't know if customs yeah. will let it go through though. Yeah, Do you probably still have not. old eagles? Can I get one of those? definitely you definitely cannot no Uh, (laughs) No. okay no i'll just get the crystal palace one yeah (laughs) Uh, well i was there any little tidbit that you have maybe thought would be fun to share that i had not touched on Ooh, what have we what have we got hannah anything good (laughs) well we've said about the blue castle so Mm -hmm. the read long is still happening that series that season mini season will be dropping next month so keep an eye out for that and then the scandal season will be coming later this year mm-hmm. so towards the end the book is coming out next month so go That's pre-order right. a copy of that now links below <laughs> my <laughs> youtuber now yeah <laughs> that yeah. was embarrassing okay good did that again um no, I don't think so. And then we've got, we do have Team Gaskell and Team Alcott shirts oh, yeah. for sale on Teespring. That's a thing. I did, oh, not, yeah, I did not think of until right before the interview. I have mm-hmm. a Team Bronte shirt. Um, oh, perfect. And yeah, so I didn't wear it, but yes. It's all good. Very all fun good. to, um, you. I, I think it's cool to have merchandise like that for when you're out and about. You might not have met another, you know, 19th century literature fan. Yep. Not for <laughs> The clothing or the mug or do you have bumper stickers we have some no, stickers maybe we should yeah. just regular stickers okay. you could put it on your car if you wanted to that's you not advising that i don't know if that will come <laughs> off but um yeah we we've got some merch uh which you know goes to just like hosting kind of and also partly getting us around for oh, these yeah. literary tourism seasons and then um yeah what else we got I think that's it. I mean, I will say, you know, with that giveaway, if anyone wants to, yeah, tell us what you had for breakfast. And if anyone's a, you know, hairstylist in Chicago, (laughs) hit me up because it's been about 18 months. (laughs) I've just been like catching myself on screen. Like it's too much. It's too much. The quarantine hair. (laughs) I had like, I had a bob. And a full fringe when this quarantine started. I know. And it's just luxurious and just all over the place now. So I, I would also like a haircut if anyone. Well, yeah, if anyone's it. down there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like the week before, I just happened to, I had, my hair had been bugging me for a long time. And so I had her cut six inches off. And so I was oh. very glad I had that done. You're ahead of the game. Well, and and it was just it wasn't me you know I I wasn't strategizing it just happened that way just happened it just happened <laughs> well Hannah and Lauren this has been a dream come true thank you so oh. much for taking time out of your schedule because I know you guys have interviews and you put in a lot of time and it really shows with the the quality of the show so cannot oh, wait you. to read why she wrote and um, I'll just put kind of closed in parentheses after I have ended the giveaway and I'll just have it below screen because I forget when in my schedule I have that this video is going sure. but yes it's all I'll good give, like I'll give like a week for people to to tell them tell us what their favorite breakfast food is and right. if you know a hair cutter in Chicago listen 
open to suggestions. <laughs> <laughs>